Hello beautiful friends, I hope you're all doing incredibly well. I am doing something a little bit different with this video. As I am filming this, I have already finished the book and finished filming my vlog and all of that. The reason why is because doing reading vlogs is really difficult because you're filming everything in real time and your real raw reactions, but for me, oftentimes after I finish a book, my thoughts and my opinions and everything kind of change and grow and transform over the next few days, sometimes weeks, and I don't get to talk about that. So with this book, spoiler alert, it has basically changed my life and I love it with my entire heart. I could get emotional just talking about it, and I do. <laughs> And I did not want to do that with this book. I wanted to give time to really soak it in and then talk to you guys about some things. And the reason why is because, as I said, this book has basically changed my life, but also because I have learned how much hate this book also gets and I wanted to address those things. I have been hearing about Redeeming Love for many years, mostly when actually the movie came out. I had heard about it before that, but when the movie came out, is when it really got popular again because a lot of people were upset with how it was done. I don't want to take too much time because obviously this video is incredibly long. <laughs> As I said, this is just so important to me, so I really wanted to talk about these points before I jump into my reaction and vlog. So first thing I wanted to say is that this video is likely going to be very choppy because I filmed it initially not wanting to do any spoilers, but then as I got further in the book, I learned how difficult that would be. So this video has full spoilers, so obviously I have put that in the title, but I wanted to warn you that if the video is edited kind of choppy and a little weird, that would be why, because initially I didn't want to give spoilers and then it just became impossible. So as I'm sure many of you know, this book was kind of based almost like a retelling of the book of Hosea in the Bible, which is about Hosea and Gomer, Gomer being a prostitute and Hosea taking her as his wife. Now a lot of people say that this is a retelling, but there are a lot of people who are upset by saying that because it really isn't. I would say that this is more inspired by the book of Hosea rather than a direct retelling, and I think it's really interesting that so many Christians are upset because it's not like an exact retelling, and so that's why they kind of brushed this book off, but it is a piece of fiction, and we have the Bible, which is the word of truth, and then we have fiction that looks at things through a different lens and different angles to learn. A lot of people who are against this book will say, just read the book of Hosea. And while I agree, I also think that many lessons and especially more modern problems are looked at uniquely through fiction. It gives us real life situations that are applicable. And something that I actually heard recently too was that, <laughs> and people might be upset by me saying this, but it's true that Jesus told fictional stories to create the word, to create the Bible. Jesus reading parables was Jesus telling fictional stories to get his point across and to teach us valuable spiritual lessons that are applicable to our real lives. Now, in regards to the book of Hosea, I think that it's really important to note that the Old Testament, and in this book specifically Hosea, that it is a foreshadow of Jesus and his love for us. Now one thing that I want to talk about, I briefly mentioned this in my vlog later on, but I didn't talk about it quite as much as I wanted to because I was kind of nervous how people would take it, but that is the character of Michael Hosea and that he is essentially perfect. He's absolutely perfect, he has no flaws, he is just like the perfect man. He's devoted to God, he loves Angel, he's pursuing her, he's a hard worker, and just all of these many, many perfect qualities that he has. And this is an issue that people take with this book. And I watched this video from somebody that I actually really love and admire, and they were talking about how they regret reading this story when they were in high school and college and all of that because it set them up to resent reality and to lose contentment with their life and put false expectations for their future marriage and their future spouse. And I found that to be very sad, but I understand. I understand. I had talked about this a lot in my A Court of Mist and Fury vlog about how the male main character in that series is also like perfect and it can be very easy to read stories like that and like this and compare your spouse to that. And that can be a slippery slope. With that said, I don't believe it was the intention of Francine Rivers to cause that to happen in this book. And the reason why I say that is because 
Francine Rivers has said herself that Michael Hosea is an allegory for Jesus Christ. And I think that that just completely changes my perspective on this book. And I hope that it helps people understand why Michael Hosea was written the way that he is. I don't believe that this is intended to make women lose contentment with their marriage. Can it happen? Absolutely. And with that said, I think that can happen with any piece of fiction in the world. One of the quotes from the woman that I listened to talking about how she regrets reading the story had said that Michael Hosea produces a longing that is not satisfied in reality. And I agree. There is no man on earth who can satisfy us emotionally and spiritually in the way that Michael Hosea does because as I said he's perfect and the only perfect man is Jesus Christ and I think that it can be difficult to read a book like this in a romance setting and not compare your spouse but it is the responsibility of the reader to have boundaries like that and I'm not gonna lie there were times when I was reading this book or other books and the comparison thoughts kind of started and I had to put the book down and say okay nope I'm not gonna go there. I'm not gonna go there. And I think it'll make it much easier for me to read in the future without having that mindset, knowing that Michael was an allegory for Christ. And with that said too, I did read some comments under that video from men who had said that this book was actually really inspiring to them on how to be a good husband, how to be a good spouse, and how to chase and pursue a woman and treat her well. And I think it's also really inspiring to a lot of women, myself included. Reading this book really inspired me to pray for my husband and to grow closer to God and to have a deeper, more profound relationship with our Creator. And I think one of the most beautiful lessons out of this book for me was that it was Michael's love to Angel that changed her, but it, ultimately it was Angel loving him back that really changed her. And putting that allegorical picture in there with Michael being the Christ figure of this book, I guess you could say, was when Angel received Christ and became a believer, that's when everything changed for her. And I think that is just so beautiful and it's a testament to God's changing and redeeming love for each of us. Now, in regards to like the spiciness of this book, I don't consider this spicy at all. I understand that maybe some people would because it does allude to sexual things, but nothing is ever descriptive or described or anything like that. But I talk about this quite a bit in this video that I actually absolutely love the way that Francine Rivers handles the intimacy in this book. I think it is just the absolute perfect balance. I'll, I'll talk about this more later on as I said, but I just think that she did it so beautifully. Honestly, I think that Christian fiction is a great way to cover intimacy for people because a lot of us grew up being taught that sex was a dirty and wrong thing and so we go into marriage maybe having trouble with it. And this book, at least to me, spoke of it so beautifully because Michael is teaching Angel that the way that she was raised in prostitution and such, sex was a dirty and wrong thing. Whereas Michael is teaching her that it's a beautiful thing between a man and a woman who love each other within the confines of marriage. And I just love the way that he's teaching her and showing her. And that's really applicable to so many of us, myself included. And I just love and admire the way that she did it in this book. I understand that some people may consider this book spicy because it alludes to those things, but I think that this book should be intended for a mature audience with that, just knowing our boundaries and the mature content that we can take in. I think it's Song of Solomon 2-7 that talks about not awakening the lust until you're ready to be in a marriage and have your spouse to have that intimacy with. And I agree with that. I don't think that this book is appropriate for a younger audience. However, I do think that it can be beneficial to people who are looking to marry and having good expectations for a marriage and how to love like Jesus does because that is who Michael was in this book. He was showing us how to love like Christ and loving like Christ is hard. There are many times when Michael is weeping and when he's on his knees praying and begging God and that is a Christ-like thing. Jesus himself was on his knees crying and begging God for things and for me that is really inspiring. Literally when I finished this book I did pray. I was sobbing and I was praying and it's just so beautiful and this book has just inspired me so much to change in beautiful ways. Like I, oh gosh, I know this sounds so dramatic but like I will never be the same after reading this book. It has just been so inspiring and encouraging and uplifting and like I said 
it handles the tough subjects so incredibly well. Obviously, I have stopped wearing makeup in my videos because I cry in every single one it seems <laughs> but this book really did just make God so real to me and like I of course I've always known that he is real but this has just taken it to like another level for me and so personal and I just I'm so grateful that I read this book the ending scene when when Angel is walking to Michael and like taking her clothes off like I was kind of like oh <laughs> you know but I just think that the description of it was so beautiful of her peeling off her pride to approach Michael fully before him and it reminded me of one of my favorite songs called Tender by Taylor Armstrong and it's about God being tender towards us and part of the lyrics say exposed naked but fully clothed you undress my soul and I just thought it was so beautiful because obviously like I said with Michael being an allegory for Christ it's like coming to Jesus fully as yourself and I just love it so much. Now I'll try to get through this last little section as quickly as I can but I have been watching interviews with Francine Rivers. Oh my goodness. This woman is like so inspiring. I just love her. I don't know why I'm crying about it <laughs> because like she's human you know just like the rest of us but gosh in these interviews I'm like my goodness this woman just has like peace that surpasses all understanding she is so peaceful and calm and like just such a beautiful person and I would love to just sit with her and let her pour into me and talk to her about all of this because after reading her books and after listening to her in interviews I'm like I want to read the bible I want to learn and I want like just the way that she told the story and the way that she's speaking about her life and the way that she writes it like makes me want to dive into God's word and to learn more and to be more and it's just she is so inspiring and I absolutely adore her so much and I can't wait to read the rest of her books. She just radiates the Holy Spirit and it's just amazing. <laughs> And I love that she talks about writing being a form of worship for her. God has given this gift to her for a reason and she's utilizing it so incredibly well. And she believes, as do I, that God can use anything to teach us. And she's doing that through fiction and I just absolutely love that because there are so many Christians who avoid fiction because they're like, why would I read fiction when I can read the Bible? And I understand that. but fiction can teach us so much about Jesus and about faith and I think that the reason why I love fiction so much is because it talks about so much tragedy and so much trauma and so does the Bible and I remember her talking about the movie and how it's rated PG-13 and see, some people were upset about that but she was like the Bible is rated R. There's so much trauma and hardship and even sex in the Bible that is talked about and I think that you know obviously there is a boundary. I'm not gonna go out and read a bunch of explicit spicy erotica books you know which by the way Francine Rivers actually used to write before she was a Christian but I think that it still can be addressed in a beautiful and biblical way and I do believe that Francine does that in her book. I have personally avoided reading Christian fiction for a long time because I felt like it was just gonna be hippy dippy positive you know and I am just so happy that I found Francine Rivers where she includes the hardships of life and the trauma and the tragedy and all of that because I think that's what makes it real and it makes it so applicable to our lives and she also stated that this is how she's reaching unbelievers and I think that is so beautiful. Redeeming love has been used to help women out of prostitution and trafficking. And she was asked to speak in an event for traffic victims and she was like, why would you ask me? And these girls who were in trafficking said, because you know us so well, like how did you know these things? And she's like, I didn't. God just told me to write it. And I just think that's so beautiful. <laughs> she talks a lot about how fiction can be a bridge to unbelievers. And I think that is so beautiful so true and obviously there are the cases with like C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien who have reached people with faith through fiction and I think Francine Rivers is doing that on such a beautiful monumental scale and I am just so grateful that she has followed the voice of the Holy Spirit and written the books that he's told her to write. She also even said that 
she wrote the book in the movie because she did write the script for the movie as well she, I think she might have said this about the book but for sure about the movie that she didn't write it for Christians she wrote it for the world so that people could get to know Christ through fiction even if they weren't using his name as Jesus with Michael Hosea there was still that character within him to be shown to the world and I just think that is so beautiful. I also find it really amazing that she was talking about how she has seen so much of herself in the character of Angel. <laughs> like just talking about this woman just makes me cry because I just like I've come to adore her so much. But Francine Rivers called herself a harlot and she was like I was never a prostitute you know I, I never did any of that kind of stuff but in my own ways like I was a harlot and I was running from Jesus and that's why she wrote Angel running away from Michael obviously of course because in the book of Hosea that is how it plays out but also because that's what we do to Jesus we turn our backs and we run away from him and just seeing Michael Hosea as an allegory for Christ just makes me see this book through such a new and beautiful lens after I've already read it but just looking back I'm like oh my gosh like just with that perspective everything changes in a more beautiful way and it's so funny because I mentioned in my video about how the bookish community is always like oh my bookish boyfriend is Cassie and my bookish boyfriend is Reese and my bookish boyfriend is so and so and I would just kind of laugh I'm like yeah that would be great because like these fiction men are always written so perfectly but then in this in this video I'm like you can have all of them you can have all of them I would take Michael Hosea basically I would take Jesus Christ like yeah yeah absolutely he's perfect Jesus Christ is perfect and it's so funny because Francine Rivers was talking about how she was signing books and a woman came up and said oh I want my own Michael Hosea I want a man just like Michael and Francine Rivers looks at her and goes Jesus is the man <laughs> and I just love that Jesus is the man Jesus is the perfect man that we all need and so when I was listening to that other video about the woman talking about how she regrets reading redeeming love because it gave her all these false expectations that can't be fulfilled and it's like yes it can maybe not in our spouse but through Jesus it can I just hope that we all get that perspective when reading this book if we might start to feel like oh I want my own Michael Hosea we can and that man is Jesus Christ it's not going to be our spouse all of our spouses are so imperfect and reading this book you can even see that like Michael Hosea does not have any flaws like we don't get to know about his annoying habits or him losing his temper or anything like that I mean I guess there might be a part that you consider he loses his temper when he like hits somebody but at the same time like that's righteous anger <laughs> so I don't know you don't get to see the real raw parts of marriage because marriage is hard it is it's a work there are so many people who talk about like oh my marriage is perfect we never fight and I'm like <laughs> we're all sinful imperfect beings there are going to be things that annoy us and that drive us up a wall and that's okay it's part of learning to love like Jesus loves and I just I have so much more to say but I'm not going to because this video like I said is already so long and I just wanted to put these disclaimers at the beginning of the video because this entire video is basically me just gushing over how much I loved this book. There's not a single thing that I didn't like about this book. Even when people say like oh it gives you false expectations for a man or it can rob you of your contentment in your marriage. I understand that. I value that perspective. I get it. But again, I don't think that this book was written with those intentions, especially being that we're supposed to see this as a Christian allegory of Jesus. And also, like I said, it is our responsibility as readers to know our boundaries and our limits and what we should or shouldn't read. And as I said, when I finished reading this book, I just sobbed and I prayed. And Francine Rivers, oh my gosh, why do I keep crying every time I say her name? <laughs> but she's just been such an inspiration to me. And like I said, I've been watching interviews of her all day today and a little bit yesterday and I am just so inspired by her. Like I said, just watching her interviews, I'm like, oh my gosh, she just like radiates the Holy Spirit and I just absolutely love it. And I do think that every opinion is valid in regards to her work. Obviously, we're all different. We're going to see things very differently and we're going to take things very differently. And for me, this is just me and my perspective, but I am just so grateful that she wrote this story. I can't wait to read her other books. I know that there is so much that I'm forgetting to say, but I've tried to cover what I can. So I love this book. It has changed my life and I am so excited to dive into the word with a new fresh perspective of Jesus and God and his forgiveness and his love for us. 
and I really hope that that's what you get out of this book as well. So with all that said, without further ado, let's get into my reading vlog of reading Redeeming Love by Francine Rivers. I'm so excited to talk to you guys about this book. I love this book so much I cannot even like I don't <laughs> I don't even know where to start I'm just I I love it I love it so much and I I <laughs> I want it to last forever I've been forcing myself to put it down every night I'm trying to make it last for as long as possible which probably makes me a really bad like booktuber because most people like get through books like crazy. I do not. If I really enjoy a book, I want to make it last longer. So I am only on page 189, chapter 15, and I started it a few days ago, but I am just so in love with this book. I cannot even stand it. I've got some good tabbies going on. I did not start tabbing right away because as I had mentioned in a couple videos ago, I was kind of nervous that I wasn't going to be super into this book because it's more of like an 1850s California gold panning time era book and that's like the opposite of my vibe so I was kind of nervous that like I wouldn't be as into it but boy was I wrong because I love everything about this book I just oh, I love it so much okay so let me talk about it I'm currently at the part where Paul shows up which is of course Michael's brother-in-law late brother-in-law brother-in-law because his sister has passed away and this was her husband and he recognizes angel and it does not go very well but i love i love that part because michael totally like stood up for angel like angel has been treating him like garbage this whole time right and then the second paul like bashes angel michael just mm. gosh i love it so much <laughs> He just stood up for her and literally like punched Paul in the face and was like, you insult her, you insult me. Like we're married, one flesh. And so obviously at the end, Angel ends up leaving with Paul to go back to paradise. And I stinking love what she said to him at the end because of course Paul's like insulting her like you're nothing but a prostitute, once a prostitute, always a prostitute, like whatever, whatever, right? And I stinking love, love what she said to him because he said, you know what, Angel, you're overrated. You aren't worth more than two bits. <laughs> Something burst inside her and what are you worth? What do you mean, he says. <laughs> she came closer and snatched the shawl from the side of the wagon. I know what I am. I never pretended to be anything else. Not once, not ever. She put her hand on the edge of the wagon seat and here you are, borrowing Michael's wagon and his horse and his gold and using his wife. She laughed at him. And what do you call yourself, his brother? That is such a good line. Like, you're sitting here bashing me for my past when what you just, you just had sex with me, a known prostitute, married, married to your brother. Like, and you're gonna insult me? Like, excuse me? Anyway, so yeah, just the defense that Michael has for her and how she has just, she's growing and she's trying to fight against it so hard, but she is and she's just so witty and I just love her. I'm just loving Angel and her resolve and her kind of headstrongness, if that makes sense. I love Michael. Everything about Michael. Everything. I mean, his devotion to God, the way he's loving on Angel, the way he's trusting God, the way that he also feels his emotions. Like, yeah, he's a godly man, but as Christians, you can still get angry. You know, you still struggle with things. You still question things. He's a godly man hearing from the Lord. And even he is still like, gosh, Lord, are you sure? I don't know what to do. I don't know if I can do this anymore. And I just think that is so raw and so beautiful. And I'm just loving this book so much like new favorite book literally i'm not even halfway through i mean of course once upon a wardrobe is still like my favorite book but this is also my favorite book like i feel like we have to be allowed to have more than one favorite book because obviously they're in different realms you know what i mean okay the other thing i'll mention too before i move on is that i'm really loving how francine rivers talks about intimacy a lot because obviously i have read spicy books in the past i'm not a spicy book girly but I have no problem reading stories that have them because I don't mind skipping over them or just like quickly like reading the dialogue throughout in case there is anything. And 
yeah, so I'm kind of used to that, but as a Christian and somebody who really values, like, I don't want to say purity because I know that that has kind of become almost a dirty word in the world because there has been a lot of abuse around it, but I love that Michael is celibate when he meets Angel and I love the way that Francine Rivers covers the intimacy with him and how like it's still a struggle for him to want to have her physically and he sees her body and he's like there's not really any non-crass way to say this but he's like turned on you know what I mean and like the way he handles that is just so beautiful and I love that this is closed door but still strongly alludes to the intimate moments if that makes sense so like it'll talk about how you know they're going to be intimate and then it'll say like when he was done having her when they were done having each other like just the way that she says it is just so beautiful because I feel like there's the extreme spicy side and then you have the closed total closed door romance where it's just like fade to black you know doesn't really it alludes but not like in an intimate way I don't really know how to say it but I'm sure a lot of you know what I mean but like this one it almost like mixes both in the most perfect way like yes this is still closed door but it alludes to enough where you can like you can kind of get that sense of intimacy with each other and i think it's so beautiful i love it and i love so much that he is talking to her about intimacy in the sense of like it's a gift from god for man and woman in their marriage and how it's an expression of love for one another and i want to change your mind on that because obviously your whole life it's been an abuse and it's been negative and it's been wrong and dirty and i want to show you that it can be beautiful and i just love that so much so much because i feel like so many people struggle with that in real life and i just think it's a subject that needs to be handled with care and i think that francine rivers does that so well in this book i just love the way that she's handling it and the way that she's referencing it and the words that she uses so that we still understand that it's intimate and it's beautiful but not that it's like crass or dirty you know but it's also not completely X'd out of the picture because it's something that should be beautiful and normalized within marriage. And I just love it. So obviously I have a lot to say about this book and I'm not even halfway over, but I, I'm obsessed. I love when he brought her to watch the sunrise. <laughs> I think one of my favorite parts that I have starred and everything, it says, she lay in the safety of Michael's arms and dreamed of a high, thick wall. He was there below her, planting vines. As soon as they touched the soil, they grew, spreading the green life up the sides and working their strong tendrils between the stones. The mortar was crumbling. <laughs> like he's getting through to her and it's just so beautiful and I love it so much. I cannot even stand it. Going back to the intimacy conversation really, really quick. I know that some people still consider this book inappropriate, I personally, like I said, I think it's the perfect balance, but I love that in the relationship for the first, I think, few months, maybe, Angel refused to call Michael by his name. She just calls him Mr. because that's what she called all of her clients before, and he is like begging her to say his name the first time they're being intimate, and he says, look at me, beloved. Why don't you say my name? Say my name, please. And I just like was crying at this part because I thought it was so beautiful. But he says to her, this can be beautiful. It doesn't mean what you've been taught. It's a blessing. Oh my love, say my name. <laughs> like I said, I've cried so much during reading this book and it's like at the weirdest moments for some people I feel like, but I don't know. That subject is really important to me because Full disclosure, TMI maybe for some people, but like Steven was the first man that I had ever been with. And so I had a really hard time with intimacy when we got married because it was never explained to me in a beautiful way like this. Like it was always taught to me as like being dirty and wrong. So it was something that I really had to like grow in and reading this book, it's just like connecting so well because even though obviously I don't have the same past, as Angel in that area, a lot of the feelings are still very relatable. And so I just find it so beautiful. And I love Fr Francine Rivers writing so much. And I just can't wait to get more into this book. I don't want to say finish it because I don't want to finish it because I want it to keep going. <laughs> anyway, I'm so sorry. I've been talking for so long, but I cannot wait to share more of my thoughts with you guys. And I hope you don't mind me being maybe TMI with some stuff. I don't know. That's just who I am. Sorry. <laughs>
I am on my lunch break so I'm gonna eat and then I have to work overtime tonight but I still plan on getting some reading time in tonight and I will talk more with you guys over the next few days. <laughs> forced myself to not read for a couple days because I wanted to one film this update and then also because I am loving this book so much that it like physically hurts and I'm like emotionally so tied in and devastated and I needed to like step away and give myself a few days to like chill out. I've made it to page 383. I'm almost done with it. I only have this much left and like I said I forced myself to stop reading for a few days because I'm just like I don't even know okay so where to start um so as I said in I think my last speaking clip I had just left off at the part where she was going with Paul it's kind of hard to gather all of my thoughts but I love Michael with my whole heart um <laughs> So obviously in the bookish community, everybody's always talking about like their bookish boyfriends and everybody's like Reeson and Cassian and Zayden and Aaron and all these other characters from books that I've never read. And I'm like, you can have all of them. You can have all of them because Michael Hosea is like, I love that he is so traditionally masculine, like both physically and emotionally and just in every way that you could possibly want a man to be masculine he is he defends Angel every chance that he gets whether it be verbally physically emotional like he just has such a love for her and is willing to fight for that in the most beautiful ways the first thing that I'm thinking of that I wrote down was when he was talking to Paul Michael says you know when you hurt her you hurt me and all that really matters is what I think and what God thinks and that's it. Your opinion of my wife does not matter. And oh, I just loved it. When Angel goes back to paradise the first time and Michael is of course devastated but when he goes and gets her and of course you know she's with another man in bed and he walks in and sees her and just immediately throws down literally takes this man throws him through the door and like starts fighting off all the other guys and is just dominating physically just destroying everybody and I actually love that he like manhandled Angel he grabbed her and he's like let's go right now like just didn't even stop to think about where her head was at with anything he was just like no and just dealt with it just beat these dudes and it was fantastic and I loved it and the other beautiful thing about that too is that after that scene when they come back to the cabin I love that it says he prepared himself for anything on the way to paradise but when he walked into that room and saw for himself what she was doing he had almost lost all reason if he hadn't seen her eyes or heard the way she said his name he would have killed them both but he had seen and heard it for one brief unguarded instant he'd known what she really felt relief relief so profound it stopped him cold that he he realized that she truly wanted him to be there even though she didn't want to admit it to herself she was hoping that he would fight and come back and get her and I just love that he just heard it in his voice and he was able to just shut down the hurt and the emotions that he felt and fight for her anyway and their conversation about it and how he was just saying and I'm probably gonna cry but like he stopped and glared at her it's a lifetime commitment in my book lady it's not an arrangement you nullify when things get a little tough to bear until death do us part 
And she's like, but why? And he's like, because I love you. When will you gonna, when will you understand that? And no matter how much it hurts and no matter how much I feel like hurting you back for what you've done, I'm not going to. And they're having this conversation about like what each of them wants and what he wants is just I want her, you know, I want you to love me. And for her, she says, I want freedom. And he says, you are free. You just don't know it yet. Everything about this book is just so good. And then of course, it broke me slightly after that the next morning when she got up and he was gone and she goes out to find him and she finds him in the barn and it just says he was sitting head in his hands weeping. I was sobbing at this part. I was sobbing that he was just so heartbroken, you know, and it's just, gosh, this story is just so beautiful. After that, I thought it was so heartbreaking, the part when she is cleaning herself in the stream right after this, and she's cleaning herself so hard, she's making herself bleed and she's bruising herself because she's starting to see Michael for who he is, that he's actually like a good godly man. And then she feels so dirty being near him because she doesn't feel like she deserves it. Michael reached out to put his hand on her shoulder, but she withdrew from him. He knew why now, and it pierced him to the core that she thought she was so unclean he shouldn't even touch her. But of course, he doesn't give up on her. Flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, you're already part of me. All we can do is change the way that we live, one day at a time, and it's... <laughs> I'm gonna cry just reading these parts. They're just so beautiful. The way that he just, like doesn't give up on her and he keeps fighting for her and not just for like her to love him but for her to like love herself and see that she is loved she'll kill herself trying to earn my love when it's hers already and then of course she finally shares about duke and all of that and he's just so taken aback by it and so heartbroken i love that he thought to himself what was she thinking all those times we were together was i just like all the others taking my pleasure at her expense and this part was so beautiful to me because this is where Michael just denies himself for her all over again because obviously he's remained celibate his entire life waiting for his wife and he gets her and he's holding himself back from her again even though they've already been intimate at this point he stops because he's like oh my gosh like this doesn't mean the same thing to her that it does to me and when she tries to be intimate with him and he denies her and she goes you don't want me anymore do you he didn't look at her as he spoke and said, I want you too much. I just can't stop thinking of what it must have been like. She starts to think maybe I shouldn't have told him anything. And he says, why not? So I can keep on taking my pleasure and never understand the cost to you. <laughs> I want your love, Amanda. I want you to feel the pleasure I feel when I touch you. And I want to please you as much as you've pleased me. So the fact that he's even denying himself further now that they're already married, just so that she can have the same kind of beauty and pleasure and intimacy that he does is so beautiful. Especially in our society nowadays where intimacy is so just flung around willy-nilly and most people don't value it as something so beautiful and sacred and that he is just willing to deny himself this for her and I just think it's just it's just so beautiful. All of the descriptions of Michael are absolutely incredible. He was one of those rare men who lived what he believed. Not once in a while, but every hour of every day, even when the going wasn't easy. As gentle a man as he was, as tender as was his heart, there was nothing weak about Michael Hosea. He was the strongest-minded man Joseph had ever met, a man like Noah, a man like Shepherd King David, a man after God's own heart. There's so many other descriptions of him too about how, like, he's just God-fearing and he's courageous and he's loving and he's gentle and that everything he does has a purpose, whether it's working the land or loving his wife or loving his neighbor. And he's just like, I feel like this is just the perfect description of what, like, a godly man is. And it's just so beautiful and so inspiring. I absolutely love when all of the feelings are professed when she comes back. And this is when they're in Sacramento. She leaves the second time and comes back and he gets her from Joseph's. And he was like, this is why you left, isn't it? And kisses her and says, you're in love with me and you just don't want to face your feelings. He's still just like... I love you, I love you, why can't you understand? Amanda, I loved giving you pleasure, I loved feeling you melt, I loved hearing you say my name. Love cleanses, beloved. It doesn't beat you down, it doesn't cast blame. And he just keeps kissing her. My love isn't a weapon, it's a lifeline. Reach out and take hold and don't let go. Like that is like one of the most beautiful descriptions of love I've ever heard. And then of course, the most beautiful quote in this whole book from 
my understanding is when she says you've saved me again michael tipped her face back oh his eyes so full of hope so full of love i'm only a tool beloved not your savior so the next part is when they finally meet the Altmans, which I love and I'm already crying because I love when they first meet them and Elizabeth talks about Angel without knowing her name and says to her younger daughter like yes this is an angel of mercy talking about angel not knowing her name is angel and of course angel thinking the worst of herself and i just think that this is just such a beautiful scene and it made me sob i thought it was so beautiful i love angel and miriam's friendship i think it is so wonderful and i love that the altmans know her past they know where she came from and they don't see her as any less than because of it. But Miriam and Angel are just so wonderful together because I love that Miriam is like so young and sensitive and gentle, just like the cutest little thing, but she's also so straightforward and honest and will like bite Angel's head off when she needs it. And I think it's just so wonderful and such a healthy, beautiful feminine friendship. The other thing about Michael as well is that he's not willing to give up his faith for Angel at all. I appreciate that he explained to her so gently about priests and pastors because he tried to bring her to church and she like freaked out about it and she just didn't understand well you know all these other priests and everything like that treated me and my mother horribly and Michael says priests are only men they're not God they come with their own personal prejudices and faults just like anyone else. I'm sorry and like I love that he apologized on behalf of all of that for her. Are you afraid that if you don't save my soul I'll go to hell? She was mocking him. I think you've had a good taste of it already. <laughs> I don't plan on preaching at you, but I don't plan on giving up what I believe either. Not to make you comfortable, not for anything. Oh, I just love it so much. He's just so wonderful. His story, also his background with his father and his parents and everything was so heartbreaking. The other line that I absolutely loved that made me sob was when he was talking about his mother and he said she would have liked to, she could see into people. Without thinking, Angel put her hand over his, moved by his sadness. His smile made her heart twist. Oh, beloved, he said, your walls are coming down. With personal development and personal growth being like my favorite trope, this book is just like killing me. I love the more that she is sharing her background. He's trying to like ease that ache that's in her heart about it. Like when she was talking about living on the coast with her mother and how she would love to listen to the rain because the rain would beat on like the tin roof and she would shine cans and she would like have her own kind of wind chimes. I think it was the next day Michael went out to the barn and made her her own wind chimes. <laughs> it's just little stuff like that that he does that I'm like, oh my goodness, what a dream. This next scene, it made me laugh out loud. I thought it was so wonderful and I'm so glad that it was included in this story. Angel is really starting to open up and they're basically like a couple now. Like she is in love with him even though she hasn't fully admitted it yet but Michael knows and they're just doing so well together. She's loving her life. She is appreciating the hard work that she's doing in the garden and helping Michael and assisting the Altmans with everything and everything is just going so well but she and Michael are in the barn. <laughs> I love actually the way that Michael asked her to come away with him. Sometimes when Angel least expected it, Michael would find her at her chores. Let's find a nice place in the sun, he'd whisper, putting his arms around her. Come away with me and be my love. <laughs> but that's when they were like in the barn and they were like being intimate and then Miriam like comes up and she's like, oh hi, like I was just napping and Miriam's like, mm-hmm. Well, mom wants you to come over. Oh, and Michael, by the way, and he just like laughs and he's like, okay, I'll be there. And it's just so cute. And I love that sisterly bond that they have. And then this is just being made into something so pure and romantic, but also really funny and being able to have humor about it as well. I don't know. It's just like the perfect combination and I'm loving it so, so much. I think that Angel's secret in regards to her father was incredibly devastating. That was just mind-blowing and heartbreaking to read and obviously Michael was devastated and heartbroken as well but then her other secret about not being able to have children just made me sob especially because he had made so many references to it previously with Ruthie and that whole that whole plot of that is so heartbreaking and I'm really curious to see how it turns out in the end, whether by some miracle they are able to conceive or if they don't have children, if they 
adopt somehow or what have you. If Michael dies, I'm going to be devastated and I'm gonna burn this book. Everything about the story is just so heart-wrenching and like just when you think it can't get any worse or like more devastating or more emotional, it does. I also really enjoy the other plot point put in about Miriam having feelings for Michael and wanting to have a man like him and she's in love with Michael, but she loves Angel so much that she would never do anything about it. And she just is always talking about how she so hopes that she can find a man like Michael because he's so good. I just love that. I don't know why, I just feel like that's such a real issue to be put in this when you have like this perfect man and obviously more than one woman is gonna fall for him and I just love that they put that in there but also that Angel and Miriam can still have a beautiful healthy relationship with that even though Angel definitely struggles with it of course and even before she found out about Miriam's feelings for Michael she's still like she still had those thoughts of I wish that Michael would have met Miriam before he met me because he'd be so much happier with her she can give him children she can give him a beautiful life she's a virgin she can do so much more to make him happy and I just I don't know I just really I'm glad that Francine Rivers put that additional love in this book as well because I think it really speaks to having strong female friendships. I really love Michael's other explanations about God as well. He's in me. I'm showing him to you every hour of every day the only way I know how. I just love how often he calls her beloved. What do you feel now that I'm soft clay in your hands, Michael? Joy, he said, pure joy. <laughs> this book just makes me sob. Beloved, he whispered, feeling an overwhelming tenderness at the look of uncertainty in her blue eyes. If anyone knew how or why people fall in love with one another, they'd bottle and sell it off to the, one of those traveling medicine wagons. It wasn't how you looked. It isn't that you smelled and tasted so good to me now. You know it isn't. It's part of it, she said. God knows that's true but it's something beyond just that, something unseen. You cried out to me that day when you walked by and I couldn't do anything else but answer. <laughs> they were intimate with each other. I love that it says he prayed aloud, giving thanks for the pleasure that they had taken in one another. Angel's heart was hammering violently. What was God going to think of this? No lightning, beloved, he said, understanding. All good things come down from the Father, even this. <laughs> Obviously, I had already mentioned this previously, but I, just love that he is teaching her how beautiful intimacy is supposed to be and this is also so refreshing because the bookish community is so full of like smut and taking romance and turning it into something so dirty and gross that isn't prized and isn't something that's sacred and beautiful like after reading freaking the Akatar series like <laughs> this is just a breath of fresh air and I'm loving it so much I can't even stand it. So the last two things that I'll mention because I know I've been talking for so long. The fact that Elizabeth and John named their child Benjamin Michael after Michael is like the most beautiful thing ever. I sobbed aggressively. <laughs> and then of course one of the most incredible parts of this entire book is kind of the revelation of Angel falling in love with Michael so hard that he became her god and I just think that was such a beautiful lesson in this book but when they're together and Michael knows that Angel's gonna leave again and oh I'm gonna cry so hard but while they're being intimate and God speaks to him and says let her go beloved and he's just crying like god no please please don't take her from me and he says give her to me and he says no <laughs> And I love that that makes him so human, you know, that like even though he is a godly man and he's obedient and he's wonderful and all this stuff, like he still is human. But I love that he says, I love her Lord, I can't give her up. And God responds, Michael beloved, would you have her hang on her cross forever? <laughs> oh my gosh, like what a beautiful sentiment. Ugh. So then of course, she leaves the next day and he's devastated and I love that Miriam is like just as devastated as Michael is. I appreciate that Angel obviously loves Michael so much that she doesn't want the Altmans to think negatively of him. Angel tells Miriam he's everything he seems and more Miriam. I swear on my life he's done nothing to hurt me. He's done nothing but love me from the beginning even when I hated the sight of him. I don't belong with him and I never did. I have to think of what's best for him. Oh, and then she's crying and just says, you said, gosh, you said you loved him, Miriam. Then love him and give him the children that I can't. <laughs> and the fact that this is like such a real thing that happens to people is like so devastating. 
and Paul, I'm so glad that Miriam gave him a piece of her mind because he is just so annoying to me and I'm torn between like, this whole dynamic is just so hard because it's like, obviously, I want Angel and Michael to be together because Michael's in love with her, she's in love with him, and it's a whole redeeming love story, you know? But then there's also Miriam, who's like so pure and wonderful and lovely, and also loves Michael. And it's just like so hard, you know? But then having Paul, like one of the worst characters, awful to Angel and everything that happened between them. But then also wanting Miriam to be happy when she has feelings for Paul and that he is like a good option, you know, but like you hate him, but you also want to love him at the same time. And it's just such a hard dynamic, but it's so real. And then of course, one of the last major scenes that I read was when Michael was praying. Oh my gosh. Oh, why have you forsaken me? Beloved, I'm always with you even to the end of time. I don't understand anything anymore, Lord. Losing her is like losing half of myself. She loved me. I know she did. Why did you have to drive her from me? You shall have no other gods before me. Michael's anger grew. When have I ever worshipped anyone but you? I have followed you all my life. <laughs> I never put anyone before you. He wept. Oh, I love her, but I never made her my god. And then Michael heard and finally understood. You became hers. <sighs> This is just such a beautiful lesson of love, you know? <laughs> like, I love that this is like a beautiful love story between a man and a woman, but it's an even more beautiful love story between God and man and God and woman. And it's just, oh my gosh, this book is just destroying me <laughs> in like the most beautiful way. Oh my gosh. This is another one of those things where I was like, I was gonna put makeup on to like look more presentable and then I'm like, <laughs> what a stupid idea. <laughs> so in love with this book and so in love with the story so much i just appreciate so much that this is like i was saying before equal parts of like a pure wholesome romance story combined with so much trauma and tragedy but still finding god in those moments and like i said michael hosea is just like the most incredible man he's so human but also so committed to the lord and i just love him so much and angel's character development is incredible I love her friendship with Miriam and the whole dynamic even though there are hard parts of it with Miriam being in love with Michael as well and it's just such a beautiful dynamic that they all have with each other and I'm just I'm crying so much during this book and I'm squealing so much during this book and I can't even stand it but this is again this is when I realized like oh this is why I always delay reading books that I love because I know it's going to do this to me. It's going to emotionally destroy me and like this is the kind of book and story that I love so much that it like physically hurts and I will like get put in a funk for days, sometimes weeks because I just love something so much. Like this is exactly what happened to me when I read A Court of Mist and Fury that it was so beautiful and incredible and amazing that it like it emotionally damaged me and I literally I couldn't continue reading this the series for a while like I had to stop and read a few other books first before I finished the series because that was just so good I was talking to my mom about this about redeeming love in general I love stories like this and I love romance and all that but it can also be a slippery slope because obviously like I said Michael Hosea is written as the perfect man I mean Physically, he is super attractive, muscular and strong, tan skin, dark hair, beautiful brown eyes, you know. He is a farmer, he has a great work ethic, he's out there working the fields, he is selfless, he knows how to fight, he prays, he is faithful to the Lord first and foremost, he is kind, he's funny, he's compassionate, like he's the perfect package, he's the perfect man. And while I do believe that there are men that exist that have a lot of those characteristics, I think it's really unrealistic to have that kind of expectation with a man because we have to understand that like in this world we are all sinful and we all fall short of the glory of God and there's not going to be a man in this world that is like Michael Hosea because it's unrealistic. Like I said, it can be a slippery slope, especially if you're married, to start comparing your spouse to somebody like this and it can be it can be hard so i think that if you maybe are nervous about that happening maybe pray about it about whether you should read this book or not or maybe just have your guard up when you're reading it because that is definitely a real thing that can happen to people and like i said i absolutely love this book and it's destroying me but i think it's also really inspiring me to like pray more for my husband and to pray for other people's relationships and marriages and I think that it's also a really good book for our time because 
people give up so easily in relationships whether it's a dating relationship or a marriage relationship they have these issues and they just give up and like look at Michael and Angel's relationship like so many men would have given up on Angel and vice versa, honestly. And so I think that this is just delivering a really beautiful message about not giving up and the pursuit of a love and I just love it so much. So anyway, I've been talking for so, 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 so long. I'm so sorry, but um, I just have a lot of feelings and thoughts about this book. So in case you haven't noticed. So yeah, I am going to finish this book either tonight or tomorrow night. I'm not quite sure. This is one of those things where it's like, I want to finish it because I'm loving it, but I also don't want to finish it because I want it to last forever. And if it has a sad ending, I'm going to be devastated and I'm, let's not even talk about that. Anyway, yeah. I will get to reading. I have the rest of my work day and then I'm gonna hopefully finish this, if not tomorrow, but the next time I will be speaking to you, I will be giving my final thoughts. Obviously, Sarah, Old Testament, the barren woman who gave birth to a nation, like, I did not even put that together. <laughs> and I'm just so wrecked. <laughs> I feel like I should just give my final thoughts right now, otherwise I will talk way too long tomorrow, but I'm also kind of embarrassed that I look like this. <laughs> Ugh, I apologize that the lighting is not super great. I know it would be better if I faced this way, but then, like, my face is super pale. Um... <laughs> The story was just so beautiful. Like, I'm so wrecked. Um, that ending was just stunning in every possible way. I'm so pleased. I'm so satisfied with it. I'm gonna think about this story every day for the rest of my life. Like, hands down, for sure. <laughs> so I guess, like, <laughs> oh gosh. I guess the main points that I got out of this story is... Number one, God's redeeming love is so good, but it's our responsibility as believers to live that out every day. And then that is what changes people. Like Angel said it several times throughout the book that, or that it was Michael's love for her that changed her. And it was really just Michael living out the fruits of the spirit and just loving on her no matter what in the constant pursuit and not even just for her, but also just because he loved God and he worshiped the Lord in, in every way that he could in his life with everything that he did. And I just think that was so beautiful. And it was just, 
inspiring to her and I'm pretty sure I can't think of what verse it is but there is a verse in the Bible that talks about basically if you have an unbelieving spouse your responsibility is just to be the best example that you can be for God and for Christ because we should make that look attractive we should make serving and loving God look attractive because it is the most fulfilling thing in our lives. So really, like, she fell for Michael, she fell in love with Michael, but she was also falling in love with God because that's who Michael was, I don't want to say imitating, but kind of, you know? I don't really know the best way to say that. I loved the friendships in this book. Angel and Miriam were just, like, the sweetest friends. <laughs> and then towards the end, I think it was, the girl's name was Savannah, I think. I can't remember, but this is just so sweet. And... Also in regards to Miriam, with Paul, I remember like hating his character, right? Because he did such horrible things. But at the same time, like I have to remember that he was that way because of his love for Michael. I'm not gonna be able to pull myself together to talk about this. So I'm not even gonna try to like take the time to like chill out. <laughs> I can't believe I've been wiping my face this whole time and I have a box of tissues right next to me. Gosh, I never like utilize things that I have <laughs> just in case I'll need them at a different time, you know? Anyway. <laughs> I really had to remember that like Paul was the way that he was because he loved Michael so much and you know obviously I said like worst character can't stand him but then like the more I read and before I even got to like his redemption arc I was like you know what if Angel gets forgiveness and gets to start over so does Paul like yes they did something really horrible but if we're gonna forgive Angel we have to forgive Paul too because he also had such incredible character development and obviously that ending with him ultimately repenting of his ways and apologizing to Angel and I'm sure obviously apologizing to Michael and it was just, God, such a good redemption story. I love that Paul was the one who went out to find her. Like that just made it like a million times better, you know? And then of course, Jonathan Axel, I think his name is, being the man that like rescued her from Duke. I thought that was really great. I do kind of want to know what happened to Duke because we didn't get that closure, I don't think. But I would imagine that what the banker had said that maybe he got like strung up. I don't know. But either way, I'm really curious to see how that ended. But I love that like Duke was afraid of that man. Not that man, but like God in that man. And I just thought that was such a cool addition. I love that this book focused so much on like following the voice of the Holy Spirit and doing his will and that whole part being a huge thing of it too about that man going into the brothel and he's like I have no idea why I just like felt like I needed to and then of course Angel singing the song that she felt called to and that was God's will because it would attract that whole outcome. I just love the leaning on God's will and just trusting in him and Michael doing so as well at the end and gosh this whole story is just so beautiful <laughs> and I think the biggest thing that I'm getting out of this too is just like the importance of praying for your spouse like there were so many times when it was like Michael was on his knees praying for Angel whether it was when they were together or when she was gone or what have you that he just like never gave up and he never stopped praying for her and that really convicted me because I had to stop and be like when was the last time that I was on my knees, like, desperately praying for my husband, you know? And, like, yeah, I pray for him, but, like, do I go to war for him like Michael was for Angel? You know, I don't think that a person has to have a horrible upbringing and background like Angel did in order for us to go to war for them in the spirit. And I just thought that was such a beautiful overarching theme of this entire book and I loved it so much <laughs> but also making sure that like you always have God above your spouse that you know he is the one that we need to go to first and he should be the priority in our lives no matter what don't give that up for anything or anyone and just like the verse says you know put first the kingdom of God and everything will fall in, in place and I just I think that this book really brought that verse to life for me in the best way and really when I read um I think it was oh my gosh I have so many tabs in here it's like hard to flip through the pages but it's when Paul and Miriam are talking and Paul says when is he going to give it up it tears it tears at my guts to see him on his knees over that woman. I wanted to hit him. I wanted to shake him. He was praying when I got there, down on his knees in the barn, praying for her. And all I wrote next to it was, what love? Like, he's heartbroken and he's still just praying for her. Like, what love? <laughs> and then the other part that I really, really loved is when, oh, the girl's name was Susanna, not 
whatever I said, <laughs> Savannah. <laughs> um, the other part that I really, really loved was when they were at church with Susanna's family and Angel finally goes up to receive the Lord. <laughs> and I just highlighted this paragraph. It was the longest walk of Angel's life as she went down the aisle and faced the pastor waiting at the end of it. He was smiling, his eyes shining, and she thought of Michael and felt such a rush of anguish. Oh, Michael, I wish you were here with me now. I wish you were here to see this. Will you ever know you struck the match and brought light into my darkness? Her heart filled with gratitude. Oh, God, he loves you so. <laughs> Gosh, I'm such a mess. And then the next when she's trying to figure out what to do with her life and she remembered another day when she stood in the upstairs window watching Michael below as he drove out of paradise. She remembered hearing his voice out of the agony she had brought on herself with McGowan. She remembered Michael laughing and she's here down the cornfield. She remembered his compassion, his righteous rage, his tender understanding, his strength. She remembered his all-consuming all love and she knew what he would have her do to find the answer she needed. Pray. She could almost see his face as he said it. Pray. Literally the last 50 pages of this book, I just sobbed the entire time. And just this ending I, that I can't even talk about, so beyond perfect. I like literally could not have asked for a better ending to the story. So anyway, um, yeah, I could talk about this book for like the next 17,000 hours of my life, but I won't really just know that it's my new favorite book of all time ever and I'm wrecked and I will never be the same and I'm going to think about it all the time and I'm going to apply a bunch of this stuff, obviously. And I have to mention too that like, I didn't necessarily agree with 100% of everything that was said in relation to God and such, but most of it for sure, and I think a lot of it is still positively applicable to life, and I just loved it. I loved it so, so much, and honestly, I don't have any complaints. Even if there were things that I disagreed with, 5 out of 5 stars, 10 out of 10 stars, 100% satisfactory, there's nothing that I did not love about this book, everything was perfect, even the side stories all tied in. This is just the most perfectly written book I've ever read in my life like it just destroyed me I have nothing bad to say nothing bad to say it was wonderful and I'm obsessed with it and I would love to reread it but I'm definitely gonna have to give myself I want to start rereading it right now I really do but I just I can't because I just don't want to put myself through an emotional wrecking like that again so and I will say that I still do really love and appreciate the way that she did the intimate scenes in here like they were laid out, like they, they happened, but they weren't like specific and raunchy. They weren't spicy, you know, like on a one to five scale of spice, it was like a one, maybe one and a half. It was still descriptive enough to understand, but it wasn't overly descriptive so that it would be considered like a spicy book. I love the way that she covered it. I think that it was just the most stunning thing and I'm just, I'm obsessed with everything about this book. And again, like I said, this is why I avoid reading books that I love because they wreck me and I can't think about anything else for a long time. So I think I'm going to end this now and I'm going to go cry and pray for a long time because I need it. And I really hope that this is a convicting book to all of you like it was for me to spark change in my life and to pursue the Lord more heavily and that nobody is beyond redemption. Anyway, if you've watched this far, I would love it if you would leave like the sparkly heart emoji. I don't know why, but that's just one that like comes to my mind. Thank you so much for being here and watching me cry a bunch. I know this video was very long, but I have so much to say and I didn't even say all of it. And I'm sure that once I end this video, I'm gonna be upset that I didn't talk about this, 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 and this. So anyway, I love it so much. And I'm so grateful that I read this book and I'm so grateful for all of you being here. I love you so very much and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!